Welcome to Entwine Podcast. Now, before we get started into episode 23, I wanted to take a few moments to say thank you for listening to the show. New listener or old listener, it doesn't matter. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to hear our stories. If you want to support the show, there are a few ways you can go ahead and make that happen. The first, which is super simple, is to head on over to patreon.com slash entwined and get signed up. The second is just as easy. If you like the show, then follow us on social media and share new episodes with your friends. Yes, we recognize that not everyone you connect with in the social media space is your quote unquote friend, and that's okay. Just help us get the word out. We are on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, YouTube, and Instagram at Entwine Podcast. You can find us. Last but not least is to log into iTunes and drop us a review. Remember, we're not begging for good reviews here. Just help us capture a few honest ones. So yeah, that's about it. Thank you all so much and stay twined. Entwined is a podcast about how so much of the world around us is wound or twisted together. This podcast strives to lay bare unexposed or indiscernible connections using historical and anecdotal sources. I am Elliot Gladstone, and alongside P.S. McKay, this is Entwined. Blanketed in ubiquity, humankind steadily tugs the threads of influence in an effort to command credibility. It's everywhere, and all too often goes unnoticed. Influence. I mean, people have it. Some people want it. It's everywhere. Spend a moment watching one of the blue shirts at Best Buy trying to sell a television. Or better yet, walk into any board meeting anywhere. Influence is omnipresent, and it's part of being alive. It's incredibly obvious, yet not so obvious, as a severed head, bloodied and dripping, resting atop a pile of laundry just outside the kitchen. But influence is pretty much everywhere, its dance card filled, taking turn after turn across the parquet floor with every economic class. Over time, man has endeavored to gain influence through the acquisition and disbursement of wealth, tirelessly spending money in order to impact public opinion. This is an influence, rather a mutation of persuasion into what can only be labeled as power. We see that every day too, unfortunately. There's something a lot less innocent about the giant steamroller that is the dollar, or the yen, or whatever bitcoin you choose to carry in your digital wallet. I mean, don't get me wrong, you can be rich and have influence, it happens all the time. The difference rests, layered in effort, somewhere tied up in those threads of credibility. When you think of the rich and powerful, it's hard not to consider the fictional character Charles Foster Kane from Orson Welles' classic, Citizen Kane. Kane has been repeatedly saddled with the moniker, the best movie of all time. And even though McKay disagrees with me, there is a lot to be celebrated in this film. It has become such an iconic production that it is hard to believe it almost didn't happen. Wells wrapped up production and had slowly begun the advertising campaign to promote the film. Nowadays, we hear about movies years in advance, but in 1941, Kane offered just a five-month lead time to generate media buzz. It isn't clear how the connection was drawn, but word made it to La Cuesta and Cantada, the pet name given to the giant castle overlooking the city of San Simeon. You see, William Randolph Hearst, the owner of the castle on the hill, did the math on the situation, and it wasn't too difficult to see from the ads that he bared a striking resemblance to Charles Foster Kane, and those resemblances were numerous. To those of you unfamiliar with this connection, please allow me to apologize for practicing brevity here. But both men were media moguls, both men were very rich, and they both lived lavishly in opulent mansions. Not exactly the same, but tragically similar. Charles Foster Kane tried to use his position of power as an owner of magazines, newspapers, and radio stations to impact public opinion. 
Kane and intern Hearst sensationalized the content reported on in their publications, making a splash with every exaggerated headline. As the film's release neared, Time Magazine reported that, quote, the release of Kane would mean a good old-fashioned Hearstian attack on Hollywood, end quote. The yellower the journalism, the better. The fear here was that Hearst would use his power and leverage his numerous assets to impact public opinion to ensure the film would never be released. Drama seems to be an appetizer on every Hollywood menu, but in this case the Hearstian attack might have been all too wishful thinking on the part of those in the industry because, well, it never happened. The film would get its release and arguably become the best movie of all time. Hearst wasn't the only one with a belly full of buckshot leading up to the release of the film on the silver screen. After the opening scene, Orson Welles cuts to a newsreel, just like how they were back in the 30s, which was titled News on the March. The connection was direct, but a lot less obvious, and it focused the lens ever so slightly on a man named Henry R. Luce. Like Kane and Hearst, Luce was a media mogul and had several popular publications by the time Kane was released in 1941. Henry R. Luce led an interesting life. Born into a Presbyterian missionary family, he spent the first decade of his life living in an obscure province in China. Living in the missionary compound provided safety, along with stunning views of a devastated population barely able to survive. After Henry's 10th birthday, he was shipped off to boarding school and eventually America, where he attended Yale and edited the college newspaper. Luce and a buddy worked hard while at Yale, and shortly after they graduated in 1920, entered the world of mass publications taking it by storm. Henry R. Luce attempted to convey information with a new, sharp writing style, tons of images, and even found himself taking sides on major controversies. Luce would use his influence to shape public opinion, a concept which politicians continually fail to grasp. One career politician who never failed to grapple with the influential nature of American politics was a powerful man named Joseph Cannon. He was elected to Congress in 1872, serving the people of this great nation for nearly a half a century. Cannon was self-taught in his youth, much like his personal hero, Abraham Lincoln. Joseph Cannon was a man of the people, at least that's how it started out, and he never failed to entertain the members of the House. Cannon, as Speaker, was best known for his ability to control the House with extraordinary power. A man, who many today have never heard of, left a giant footprint no other Speaker has been able to match. Many historians consider Joseph Cannon to be one of the most powerful and influential speakers of the House in the history of American politics. Cannon, initially tremendously popular, started to lose touch with the constituents he was elected to represent. Cannon was a Republican and over the years grew disconnected with what his party was fighting for. He started to pick up nicknames by the handful, being called the Iron Duke of American politics, or Foul Mouth Joe, or the Tyrant from Illinois, and most famously, Uncle Joe Cannon. He didn't get into his spot on the hill by accident, yet over time, public opinion of Uncle Joe had started to wane. Republicans like Teddy Roosevelt eventually parted ways, which marked the beginning of the end for Cannon. Times change, people change. America was growing up and the world was different. Nothing like the glory days back when the second Centennial Congress met inside the Pennsylvania State House, which as you know, is also known as Independence Hall. Despite all his power, despite all his influence, Cannon made one critical mistake when he told a representative from Nebraska to get a reputation in a very dismissive tone and demeanor. On St. Patrick's Day in 1910, when a large number of House members were away from the Hill and the representative from Nebraska made his move in an unprecedented revolt, stripping the Speaker of all his power. Cannon, to his credit, didn't give up and he didn't step down. He actually waited for the voting public to punch their voting cards and eventually punch him out. Before he left, he authorized a committee to design and build the first congressional office building in Washington, D.C. 
The structure was completed a few years before he left office, and he would have held one of the larger and more modest rooms inside the building. A lot went into the design of the facility. One of my favorite features are the 18 Corinthian columns, which support a large dome atop the rotunda. The entire thing was exquisitely detailed, down to the smallest statue. Cannon would end up having the last laugh, though, because in 1962, years after his death, the Congressional Office Building would officially be renamed to the Cannon House Office Building. Details are important, but design is arguably more important. Interesting enough are the details spilling out of castles, coliseums, and skyscrapers, but the meticulous effort that went into book design in the early 1900s begs to be discussed. Yes, book design. Okay, admittedly it's not as exciting as architecture and raising buildings from the ground up, but a lot more than you would expect went into setting type before World War II. One man who was self-taught, not unlike Joseph Cannon, was Thomas Maitland Cleland, or more affectionately referred to as T.M. Cleland. Cleland taught himself to set type, which involves slugs, composing sticks, quads, and spacing material. Trust me here, it is way more technical than what could possibly be interesting, as I would fail miserably in my attempt to verbally describe the process on this podcast. So Cleland, a man who could expertly describe his job to a stranger at a pub, taught himself the way of the typesetter and would eventually end up printing books out of his basement at a very young age. His job as a book printer eventually evolved into a book designer. Next up, art design for a popular magazine, as everybody knows that book design is just the gateway job to art design. Cleland was also known for the design of something I find myself using on a semi-frequent basis. As a typesetter, Cleland was in the natural position to design fonts. T.M. Cleland is credited with the design and creation of the Della Robbia font, and more well-known and used, the Garamond font. Go ahead, open Microsoft Word, and there it is for everyone to see, Garamond. Those of you who support us on Patreon will notice the font change in the PDF for dramatic effect. So Cleland continues his career in book design, typesetting, art design for magazine, and even dabbles in a few illustrations. Despite having several well-known illustrations, he never truly became a household name. But as America charged through the 20th century, books were needing to include more images and not just hand-drawn replications that Cleland was used to including in his various works. Photographs had started to become more and more common by the 30s in printing and even more so in publications. A woman by the name of Margaret Bork White, who worked with Cleland in the 20s, started to emerge into the world of journalism and took a famous picture of the Fort Peck Dam while under construction. Bork White is an interesting woman, and that is absolutely an understatement. She was the first female staff photojournalist for a major magazine. She was the first female documentary photographer to work with the U.S. military, and that is just the tip of the iceberg. Bork White was all over the world documenting the Dust Bowl of California as well as the Soviet Union and North Africa. In fact, Margaret Bork White was the last person to photograph and interview Gandhi before he was murdered. Many of you have seen it, shot in black and white, mostly because color wasn't common until the 50s, but more so because it was the medium of the artist. Bork White, who had captured moment after moment in stunning black and white. Gandhi is sitting, peaceful, behind his spinning wheel, reading through the pages of a book or magazine, sitting cross-legged, with glasses cresting at the bridge of his nose, so intent on the text of his pages. An aging man in his seventies, looking to weigh little more than a hundred pounds, harnessing the serenity of the moment. A man who definitely knows something of influence, as he spent much of his life as a lawyer and civil rights activist. Gandhi, in his last moments, captured by Margaret Bork White, would prove to be timeless. Bork White was obviously not shy of putting herself into dangerous situations, and during World War II would get to tag along with some B-17 bomber divisions. 
Bork White would add another first to her list as she would end up being the first female photographer to fly in a combat mission. The world called them flying fortresses, capable of dropping 600 pound bombs on Germany, or anyone else for that matter, and Bork White had a front row seat. Margaret Bork White would forever be known as one of the greatest and most influential photojournalists of the 20th century. Another American who found himself part of a B-17 bombing crew, but not as a photographer, was a man by the name of August Augie Donatelli. Before the war, Donatelli played a few games as a minor league infielder, but when that proved to be a dead end, he found himself pulling ore from a Pennsylvania coal mine. Augie would live the dangerous life of a coal miner for a few years until World War II when he decided to leave his career in the mines for an arguably more dangerous job with the U.S. Armed Forces. Augie Donatelli was a passionate man who always put his heart into whatever he was doing and eventually landed a job as the tail gunner on a B-17 bomber. This wasn't an easy job, yet Donatelli managed to fly in almost 20 successful missions before his plane was ultimately shot down over Berlin. In what must have been a whirlwind of smoke, ash, and rain, Donatelli managed to parachute to the earth, breaking at least one major bone in his leg as he landed. He was terrified and attempted to stumble to safety when he heard a sound he thought in his wildest dreams he would never hear. Halt. There it was in a German accent, but clearly attempting to convey a message to an American. Halt. Donatelli froze. He locked up, which honestly really wasn't much of a stretch since he could barely move with the one broken leg, and he immediately found himself a prisoner of war. Augie ended up being a prisoner of war, or POW, for just over 14 months. Apparently while living abroad, and living abroad is absolutely not the right term, but apparently while living abroad as a POW, the Germans allow their captured to play softball, which definitely suited Augie as he was previously a minor league baseball player. The POWs would get into heated arguments and it was eventually decided that they required someone to preside over the games to ensure fairness and to rule out the possibility of cheating. So, Augie was their man. Donatelli carried his love of the sport of baseball with him through the war and back to America when he was finally liberated from the POW camp by Russian forces in 1945. When he returned to the United States, he instantly started to umpire games in the South Atlantic Minor League, and in less than five years managed to make it as a Major League umpire. Donatelli, a POW umpire, managed to parlay his passion for the game during wartime to become one of the most famous umpires in baseball history. Augie Donatelli wasn't just an umpire. The man helped form the first Major League Umpire Association, which still exists in some format today. Think of the power and influence a Major League umpire has over the game, over the Vegas odds, over how the entire baseball clubs define themselves, Donatelli played his role as umpire much like he did behind the tail gun of a B-17 bomber, with passion and conviction. Augie wasn't afraid of anyone, and his passion for the game was clear in how he called them. Donatelli wasn't without controversy either. In fact, there were a few games which have been called into question over the years. The most notable was Game 4 of the 1973 World Series between the New York Mets and the Oakland Athletics. Augie Donatelli, a Pennsylvania coal miner and war hero, found himself at the plate to make a call on Bud Harrelson, who was not clearly tagged by the Oakland Athletics catcher Ray Fossey. A lot of speculation has come out of this game because many feel that Bud was able to make it past the tag at the plate. Interesting fact, Willie Mays was actually on deck and pretty upset with the call. Mays would end up retiring from baseball in the upcoming offseason. The umpire really does have a tremendous amount of power. Not just that, but he also has the ability to influence a lot of the subtleties of baseball. Some of it ends up being stats, but some of it could end up changing the game forever, like that single call at home plate in 1973. Influence is everywhere. Power is everywhere. But the two don't need to function together to be effective. 
Henry Luce proved that when he started his empire and created some of the most popular publications of any generation, Luce created Time Magazine, Luce created Fortune Magazine, Luce created Life Magazine, and before he passed away, he created Sports Illustrated. Henry Luce was a visionary and was almost singularly responsible for the rise of the American news media as we know it today. You might be interested to know that Joseph Cannon, he was on the very first cover of Time Magazine back in 1936. With this printing, Henry Luce made Time Magazine the first weekly publication magazine in the United States. And T.M. Cleland, he designed the first cover of Fortune Magazine. And if you Google it or check out our PDF, you will see an image of a naked woman in front of what appears to be a circus Ferris wheel. As for Mary Bork White, well, she took the very first picture to be displayed on a Life magazine, a picture of the Fort Peck Dam, which was captured in black and white and would forever be remembered on the first cover of one of Luce's more popular publications. Mr. Donatelli, yep, you guessed it. He was on the very first issue of Sports Illustrated, which was another one of Luce's major magazines. Remember, influence is omnipresent and is a part of being alive. It's incredibly obvious and finds a home in war, in baseball, in politics, in front of a pinwheel in India, and even in the creation of a well-known fawn. It doesn't matter if you're rich and famous or poor and homeless, because life isn't about power. No, life is about living, and if you do it right, at the end of it all, you will never, ever have to wonder where in the hell you parked your freaking sled. Thank you for listening. This has been Entwined. Entwined is a podcast that releases every other week and is written, recorded, edited, and produced by Elliot Gladstone and P.S. McKay. This episode was written by Elliot Gladstone. Please tune in next time to see what P.S. McKay has in store for us. For more information about the show or the authors, please check out entwinepodcast.com or visit our Twitter page at entwinepodcast. Podcast.